Hello, here we are again. And, you know, I've been in my office here for quite some hours now. And I'm still wanting to talk with you about, you know, what's written in our read through in January. And I'm, I'm kind of going through it. I've gone through parts of what's in, you know, Genesis, showing you some things there. Joshua showing you some things in Joshua. There's several books here that we we're reading, portions of them in the month of January in the read through. Four chapters a day will take you through the Bible in um, one year. Uh, one of the soldiers with me, one of my sons at the church Sunday said, Wow, you're really easing up now. We used to have to read eight chapters a day. Well, if you read eight chapters a day, then you'll be able to read through the Bible in half a year. So, yeah, so you go ahead on, and if you were able to double that, then, in, you know, in three months. I, I know a pastor friend of mine that that was his goal to read through the Bible in three months. Well, it's not just speed reading. You know, you can do that. I mean, look, I mean, you, you can't criticize anybody for reading the Bible. I mean, no matter what, slow or fast. And the Lord, by the Spirit, quickens. It's not just mental acquiescence it's like you know the, the holy spirit makes known to you the understanding that god uh, has made available for you according to the condition the softness of your heart yeah so anyway um my last talk i was into uh, job and i read seven in the beginning eight because job three friends and this particular one bill dad is responding to job because of what Job had gone through. Now you gotta read in the beginning of the book, the first chapter, because it does start out with there. I didn't go through the discussion points of, you know, the, the sons of God coming up to the Lord. Um, what the, what the, the living Bible calls in chapter two of Job, the heavenly court uh, to present themselves before the Lord. That's gonna really happen in the great day too. You can see it happen prior to the day when we stand before God for the Christians, the judgment seat of Christ for the wicked dead, the great white throne judgment. This is why sometimes I think, well, if I were to be more exegetical about it, so there are two kinds of judgments, really more than two, because there's a judgment of the angels, the fallen angels, et cetera, and all of that. But anyway, look, verse two says, where have you come from? And then they explain and they're giving an accountability to God as to what they've been doing. And the Bible, as, as though it's an insertion, um, Satan answered, and it says, um, before the Lord and the accuser, Satan came with them. So it's as though he was not the one that he was trying to get feedback from, but Satan came in there. And so therefore, he then negotiates with God toward dealing with Job. And this is what we have, is Job having gone through some crisis with himself, uh, his children, his particular, um, you know, a, a, you know, things that he had, his, his um, property, all that. So, and then now his friends who heard about it, came to him and they began to try to give him an assessment of himself and also try to explain God to him. Now here Job was a leader of these guys prior to the circumstances, but these guys somehow were trying to interpret Job's circumstances as sin. And here's what we have with Bildad's first response. And he says here in verse three, does God twist justice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? Your children must have sinned against him. I mean, come on. You, you don't know, you're guessing. That's why you said your children must have done. He says, so their punishment is well-deserved. Boy, man, that's a some awesome friend, huh? But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. And if you are pure and live with integrity, you'll surely rise up and restore your happy home. Father, help us now. I'm just still just giving them things that you've given me and talking to them, not in a complete interpretation of 
Job, but just giving them some of the things that stand out to me and that I think could be helpful to others. Bless them. Open their ears that they may hear. Open their eyes they may see. Give them understanding hearts, Lord, that they might be tender. And whatever you do in and through them, they are being brought to the place called glory because you've already made up your mind the kind of church you're going to return for. And you defined it. It has not spot, nor wrinkle, nor any such thing, but it should be holy and without blame. I'm just saying that process in life is working that in you to come to that place where the father said he's satisfied with your developmental level. Not achievements, not how large a church is, not how many books you've written, not you know, how many nations you've traveled to, uh-uh. It's where you've grown to, not where you've gone to. And that's hugely important because the construct in this uh, free market system, democracy, is about um, achievement. And God says, mm -mm, it's transformation. And there has to be a cooperation with God by the Spirit for that to happen, okay? And then your behavior begins to take it on a change different from before you were born again. And you live a life that's progressively approved of God. That which is inside the treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What are they? You know, your purity, your integrity, yes. Holiness, meekness, all the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. These are inner qualities, but they're eternal by nature. And they make you into a great looking person um, in behavior every way. So look, so for those of you who have just got a hold of this, I'm reading uh, out of Job in the Living Translation. I have the King James over here too. Uh, in Job chapter eight, I'm giving Bildad's uh, first response to Job's circumstances. I don't want to be circumstantially changed, but the Bible says in great tribulation shall you enter into uh, the kingdom of God. So there's something about the pressure of the flesh. But here is what I also understand. What you won't do by revelation, you will do by tribulation. Yeah. I don't want tribulation to come because of my rebellion. I want it to come because I'm on assignment. And that's what you got. They that live godly will suffer persecution. So yeah. So I rather I know my being godly is a greater value than any amount of persecution, yeah, that you and I can experience or go through. So here, so uh, again, build that for it says in verse nine: "For we were born, but yesterday and know nothing." That's pretty good, right there. You're right. And what's he talking about compared to what who God is and what He knows? Our days on earth are as a fleeting as a shadow. I can't believe I'm 75. Well, I will be this year. And it seems like yesterday to me, my wife is going home to be with the Lord. Seems like, wow, the 48 years we're married seems like 48 days. And, um, but I know I'm going to be tried for those, my stewardship of that woman's goodness to me. And I can't do that over, but I can if there's some area of repudiation that the spirit brings to me, I can certainly repent while I still have breath. And God not only will, through the blood, cleanse me from those mistakes, but also make me new in the sense that I'm my behavior, maybe not towards her, but in the future will be acceptable in his sight. Verse 13 says, the same happens to all who forget God. The hopes of the godless evaporate. And I mean, I, you can see people living like that right now. And... You know, and sometimes people, you judge by what other people has or don't have. It says here in verse 16 of Job 8, the godless seem like a lush plant growing in the sunshine. Its branches spreading across the garden. Its roots grow down through a pile of stones. It takes hold on a bed of rocks. But when it's uprooted, it's as though it never existed. Look at that. That's the end of its life and others spring up from the earth to replace it. But look, God will not reject a person of integrity, nor will he lend a hand to the wicked. This is some powerful stuff. So see, all of this 
this thing, whether you have or have not. The point is, you're doing life before God. And so no matter what's going on in your life, keep it between you and God. And in that way, God can explain to you what's happening or you give him his right to allow whatever is going on in the earth to have to. That's he's sovereign, meaning he's in charge. You are the created. He's the uncreated. He always existed. Now, since you were born with a limited amount of time and the ability only to travel geographically uh, in that time span and and then learn all of yours is proportional. God is unlimited. In any level, you are limited. But with God in your heart and you're giving over to him, you move into a dimension of that unlimited uh, where you inherit eternity, see? And you live a life out of that. It says our, our conversation is in heaven. Yeah, doesn't mean you're in heaven. It's talking about the way you you you, you behave fits the world that you're going to go to when this body gives out. Okay? So you don't wait in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So in other words, by the Spirit, you can understand what is the appropriate behavior before God. And you start living that out right now. Right, you give, you love unconditionally, you hold principally the standards of God. Yeah, you disciple, you raise children in a godly way, you 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 treat a wife the way that Christ would treat her. I mean, all of these things give us an opportunity to be godly. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, I get excited about this. And uh, so I'm in Job chapter eight. I'm, I'm slipped over to chapter nine. And, you know, Job's responding to it, man. So, and, and, the, ten, and, the, and the tendency would be, yes, to respond to all of this. I mean, here he is. Yes, I know all this is true in principle. <laughs> and that's pretty good. Because some people don't know the difference between principles and preferences. Because preferences is what you can prefer. They can change. But principles are the standards in which we build upon. And it does us good to understand what are the principles that we're building on in God. And these are those are some of the things I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, righteousness um, and all the fruit, and including humility contriteness, uh, living on the resource side, being a blessing, more blessed to give, all these things, giving, these are all the qualities that are inherent in the nature of God. They're in your nature too as you are born again. So come on, let's live them out. If someone wanted to take God to court, would it be possible to answer him even once in a thousand times? These guys knew some stuff. I mean, let's just face it. For God is so wise and so mighty, who's ever challenged him successfully? Because he is knowledge. The Bible says Christ has made unto us knowledge. God not only knows, he is knowledge. So how could you question him? He, he, had, he not only would anticipate your question, he gives you the ability to ask it. I mean, you're just, you can't deal with God out of any kind of human construct and think that you could come up with any kind of good solution for what's going on both in life and clearly, you don't know anything about eternity but what he reveals. If, if Job says in verse 7, if he commands it, the sun won't rise and the stars won't shine. He alone has spread out the heavens and marches on the waves of the sea. He made all the stars, the bear and Orion and Pali Pieties and the constellations of the southern sky. He does great things too marvelous to understand. He performs countless miracles. Yet when he comes near, I cannot see him. When he moves by, I do not see him go. If he snatches someone in, in death, who can stop him? Who dares to ask, what are you doing? Man, this is some awesome. See, I love reading this because this is actually our experience. I mean, Almighty God is here now and the eternal dimension actually encompasses 
the time and space dimension. And the Lord is everywhere at once. So when a person asks for revival, they're talking about a manifestation in the flesh uh, so they can observe God and his ability to be able to change the hearts of men. However, you at birth, right, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, there you are. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so the idea of looking for God to show up geographically, it, it's okay, but he wants to show up experientially and you grow in his likeness, like the difference between going to church and being the church. You not only want a revival, but you are revival. That's the point of the New Testament, the life of God. In him, you live, you move, you have your being. And I would say that many, many people don't like even think that, You said, right? that you have your being in him. So anyway, that's a lot. Um, so Job still answers these guys. These guys are nonsense, but he still answers them. And he says in chapter 10, I'm disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. My bitter soul must complain, verse one. I'll say to God, don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge you are bringing against me. Why do you gain uh, what do you gain by oppressing me? Why do you reject me, the work of your own hands, while smiling on the schemes of the wicked? Are your eyes like those of a human? Do you see things only as people see them? Well, he already knows the answer. These questions are redundant. I mean, come on, Joe. But he's hurting. And this is something that a whole lot of people uh, ought to get a hold of. In verse 8, uh, Job is saying, you formed me with your hands. You made me. Yet now you completely destroy me. Remember that you made me from dust. Will you turn me back to dust so soon? You got in my conception and formed me in the womb. See, that's a baby right there. I know that these, you know, unbelieving people know that. This is this is the scripture. You clothed me with skin and flesh. You knit my bones and sinews together. You gave me life and showed me your unfailing love. My life was preserved by your care. And that's God in the matter of creation and life. So somebody says, the power of choice, man, get out of here. But that's such nonsense. You, you didn't bring yourself into existence. And when there's conception that happens, you may have had sex, but you didn't bring that, you didn't make conception happen. You you did the thing that could make it happen, that could bring it along. But God is the one that authored life. You don't have the right to take that life. He didn't give you that right. You have the ability to do it. See, and one person said it this way, what God allows isn't necessarily what he ordained. And I'm just saying to you that God wants you standing on the principles of his word. The best thing is, if you don't want a child, don't do the thing that can bring him. If the child does happen, that means God's ordaining something to happen. That I'm, I'm an example of it. I came the wrong way. I am the right results. You see, God would have preferred my mom and dad to have been married. They weren't. But he's still getting out of this life, is his life, uh, a word that's that's probably going all over the world. I didn't make it happen. I'm probably one of the least aggressive people you want to meet in a lot of ways. Yeah. So here it is. So... Um, you know, Job is arguing with his friends, challenging what they said. He don't know what's going on with him because what I read to you in Job 1 and chapter and Job 2, he doesn't know that stuff, but he has to deal with it. So the principles that I always want you to get a hold of, not what you're going through, but how you go through it. Not what you have, but what you can handle. Some powerful things. People who are at ease mock those in trouble. They give a push to people who are stumbling. And that's that, that's what it is, because they don't want to be on the resource side of this. Yet my friends laugh at me for I call on God and expect an answer. There's a whole uh, denomination, to what, what is considered to be evangelicals who are like that. They think that intelligence and natural knowledge is the best God can do in terms of solutions. That all those things about the gifts of the Spirit and 
and the spirit, Jesus says, he'll show you things to come. That's the spirit. We, when we think about eschatology, uh, you know, the future and what God has determined, and we can get all the commentary books, there's still too much missing in them. But God can give us divine insights when our hearts are good ground and let us know exactly what his plans are. The Bible is replete with people who he has met to do that. Now, in the New Testament, we're supposed to uh, be able to, uh, in our proximity to him, as we draw near, as we are fellowshipping in the, in the heavenlies, we're changed into his image. Um, the Bible is, you know, and meaning that uh, the fact that we, when we see him, we'll be like him. In our prayer time, we're changed into his image. In our being in the word, for us to be there is God to be there. Because why? As we're fully yielded, the only life that can withstand and stand to be able to represent God is his own life in our bodies. We have the power of choice to give in to God. And that's what you got here. And Job not knowing what's going on. I just, I got like line upon line, underlined in Job. So much great stuff here. Um, in Job, it says, uh, look, talking to his friends, I've seen all this with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears. And now I understand. I know as much as you do, you're no better than I am. As for me, I'll speak directly to the Almighty. I want to argue my case with God himself. Now, that's nonsense talk, but he's doing, that's where he's at. Um, I do like a question down on verse 11. Of, I'm reading Job 13. Doesn't his maj majesty terrify you? Doesn't your fear of him overwhelm you? If not, then the vitality of your union with God isn't intact. Boy, I can't believe the time is flying by in this way so fast. And so... Look at chapter 14 with me. Verse 1, how frail is humanity? And that's a good question right there. But he's really not asking a question. He's saying, and if you don't know you're frail, just look at the rich. Look at the people that are disappearing, rich people, um, you know, in China. And um, look at, you know, the just think every blown up building, every business destroyed represents some rich person. Where are those people? Now, some of them may have their money in offshore bank accounts and, and they still may have their, their riches. But look, the next question is how short is life? How full of trouble? Uh, we blossom like a flower and then phew, wilt her, uh, wither, really. And that's, um, this is what he understood. Joe, you have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we we will live. Look at look at him thinking about our lives. Now we may talk in terms of years, but when you look back at your life, it's like I can't believe it was but a vapor. And uh, so great stuff here. Um, and I want to go ahead and get to the end. There's so many amazing things um, that both uh, I got to say, Job three friends. Uh, declared about God and um, there's stuff worth noting and I did note them I got my Bible filled with stuff again you know he's still great and um, look at what Job said in chapter 23 of um, his response to Eliphaz now it says but he knows where I'm going. And when he tests me, I will come out as pure as gold. You got to be, you got to say, I get with that. Get with that. And that's, that's great, Joe. Come on, buddy. For I have stayed on God's paths. I followed his ways and turned not aside. Now, some people, you gamble. I mean, you can't hardly find a sport where they're not gambling now. Some of you drink alcohol. Some of you politicians, you drink alcohol, you curse. Some of you, you know, do women outside of your marriage, outside of your wife, and, and vice versa. And that's the life God made you for? You know better. When are you going to repent and start living a life acceptable in his sight? 
Did God waste his life by bringing you into existence? See? See that? And I would hate to think so, and I know you do too. And um, again, I want to read this, verse 11 of Job 23. For I have stayed on God's path. I have followed his ways and not turned aside. I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. Oh, my father. When I, I've gone to church and I've asked people, how many of you eat food every day? And they, almost every one of them raised their hands. I said, how many of you read the Bible every day? And almost none of them raised their hands. You see, that's why it's important to get a read-through. Look, if you send for this, you can go online, wellingtonmoon.com, and order this. And then if you want to become a monthly partner with me, you can be a part of this um, as you're reading through. I am giving you a commentary on these months. And I'm actually doing that right now as I'm talking to you and taking you through some of the critical statements in the Bible that you, you can't, you don't want to read over them. You want to pause, see law, and hear. Um, verse 14 of Job 23 says, For so he will not do, so he will do to me whatever he has planned. He controls my destiny. You got to feel that within yourself. No wonder I'm so terrified in his presence. When I think of it, terror grips me. Woo! I mean, you can be alone and uh, you get with God and you really realize he's so amazing. And uh, Bill Dad even got this. Remember, he was the first, I did his first response in chapter 25. He says, then, he says, God is powerful and dreadful. He enforces peace in the, in the heavens. Who is able to count his heavenly army? Doesn't his light shine on all the earth? How can a mortal be innocent before God? A great question. Can anyone born of a woman be pure? After all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is more glorious than the moon. He shines brighter than the stars. In comparison, people are maggots. We mortals are mere worms. Now, that's, now Bill, Dad, you're getting some. That, that's some great stuff. Man. How did you learn that? By the things that are made. Um, Job is still fighting against those. But I do like a couple statements he said. I, I like the King James Version better. It's actually in, in uh, Job 27. And uh, I'll read it in the King James Version because it's amazing. He says, um, and in verse 5, he says, uh, My God forbid that I should justify you. Will I die? Till I die, will not remove my integrity from me. This is good right here. Watch. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Do you Are you hearing me? In other words, he's saying, I have a pure conscience before God. And here's where it says it in the Living Translation, verse 6 of, of Job 27. I will, I will maintain my innocence without wavering. My conscience is clear for as long as I live. Come on, you got to say that. In other words, I'm living to be at the level God made me. And my conscience, meaning there is no sense of evil from inside of me. That's, a, that's the transformational level right there. So this is some great, great stuff here all over the Bible. Uh, I love, you want to talk about leadership? Read Job 29. This is the leadership chapter of the Bible in my view. And there's so many amazing things about Job that affected um, the country or the city that he lived in. I, I, just, just let me read just parts of it. Job continues speaking. I, I long for the years gone by when God took care of me, uh, when he lit up the way before me and I walked safely through the darkness. When I was in my prime, uh, God's friendship was felt in my home. The Almighty was still with me, and my children were around me. My steps were awash in cream, and the rocks gushed olive oil for me. Look at this. Now, this guy is not just making up stuff here. This is the level he lived on. 
He said, those were the days when I went to the city gate and I took my place among the honored leaders. He's like a judge. He's a leadership. The young men, the young stepped aside when they saw me. And even the aged rose in respect at my coming. Lord Almighty. The princes stood in silence and put their hands over their mouths. The highest officials of the city stood quietly, holding their tongues in respect. That was Job before all this happened. He's saying, all who heard me uh, praised me. All who saw me spoke well of me. For I assisted the poor in their need and the orphans who required help. Bad boy. I mean, not bad, negatively bad, but great. I helped those without hope, and they blessed me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Oh, my God. This is just so, I mean, you got to, like, this got to be a chapter you carry around in your pocket or in your purse. I mean, I'm just saying, leadership is what he's talking about. These qualities that he had, you can reverse them. It doesn't matter what gender you are when you understand you're called from God. Everything I did was honest. Righteousness covered me like a robe, and I wore justice like a turban. I served as eyes for the blind. Look at this. And feet for the lame. Whew. I was a father to the poor and assisted strangers who needed help. I broke the jaws of godless oppressors and plucked their victims from their teeth. I thought, surely I will die surrounded by my family after a long good life. For I'm like a tree whose roots reach the water, whose branches are refreshed with the dew. New honors are constantly bestowed on me, and my strength is continually renewed. Everyone listened to my advice. They were silent as they waited for me to speak. And after I spoke, they had nothing to add, for my counsel satisfied them. They longed for me to speak as people long for rain. They drank my words like a refreshing spring rain. When they were discouraged, I smiled at them. My look of approval was precious to them. Like a chief, I told them what to do. I lived like a king among his troops and comforted those who mourn. I got I got to end right there, but is that not amazing? That's got to be you right there. Woo! Years, the passage though, through much tribulation, shall you enter into the kingdom. He said, I already lived like that. Now he's been tested in a circumstance that he didn't know was coming. He's recounting that level that God had brought him to. And now here he is. Now, I would love to go through the rest of this book of Job with you. And just stop talking about just there's just so many amazing things. Maybe I can, um, you know, come back to this one more time. But I don't know. You, you, you got to read starting when, um, you know, the eternity talk of Job 38. It's nothing but amazing stuff. And um, I love it. And, you know, I love when Elihu started to give his solutions. I mean, look, the chapters 38 to the end of Job are just so amazing. I, I, they're, they're, they're so written upon. I, um, you can hardly read it. I got to go now. Well, I appreciate you and love you so much. And uh, God is so good. I love being saved. I love talking to you. And I believe God is, I mean, you're going to be used. And I'm just saying that whatever circumstance you're in, if it's a need-based circumstance, God's the solution for it. Call on him. If you're already, like all the natural stuff, you got that, but you got relational issues. Come on, this day is the day you're coming out of that, okay? This is the word for you. And if you are being challenged as a leader, you are one revelation away from the solution that's gonna make the difference in your responsibility before God. In the nations, you have a burden for the nation? Well, God is now clarifying your understanding of your responsibility in that nation. Sure, you, you, you have more than one job, it's not just his name, it's his destiny. Your destiny is an amazing destiny. And just because you're a female doesn't mean you can't lead. Lots of females are leading. The great sad thing about some of them is without a sense that God is the guiding force of their leadership skill. 
Education is all good, mm -mm. but you need transformation that's going to make the difference. Well, there's a lot more I could say to you. I do pray for your health, and I know lots of you are facing stress, and you're dealing with um, a lot of emotional upheavals. And look, the Lord is there right now to make a difference in your life. What? I mean, right now. Father, I'm asking you right now, break the bondage of fatalism in their thinking. And Lord, loose the hold of their emotional um, challenges and the fact that they are ready to give up. I declare they're giving in. and You are the solution for their future. Thank you so much, Lord. Fulfill your work in them. And we give you glory now in advance. Man, this has been an awesome time with you today. Okay, I got to go now. The, I'm really teaching out of this read through, and I don't know when I'm going to stop. I'm just, I just feel led to do it. I got a lot of other topics I could talk on, but right now I'm in the month of January just teaching you selected passages out of those readings there. And um, got a few more days I could get through. Listen. You want to support this and help me get this out to the whole world? Thank you. Um, lots of people send it to Cash App. They're not worried about a write-off. So dollar sign Wellington Boone is my Cash App. Dollar sign Wellington Boone. Do it one more time. Dollar sign Wellington Boone and send it. I mean, and for what I'm called to do, I mean, yes, I'm thankful for whatever you send. But if you send a significant gift, it's going to make a difference. I'm just saying right now. And um, I, I don't want to think about the resources I need to do the work I'm called to do. And I believe there are people out there that say, Bishop, you just let me know what God wants you to do, and I got you covered. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I got to go one more time. I love you, and I appreciate what God is doing in your life. Be encouraged, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Is my prayer for you. I'm willing to boo. Bye-bye.